Hey everybody, welcome to UCTV. Today's Monday and it's a new day, it's a new week. We have to start in the best way. My name is Samantha Lesqua and I wanna say welcome to all to one more time to Unity Coalition. And today Unity Coalition is turning into UCTV. Yes, we stay connected and, and let remind to everybody that this show is provided by Gilead, Ambiente Magazine, and of course, Care Resource because they make this possible. Today in UCTV, we're gonna talk about politics, LGBT and politics. What we're gonna do to move forward with the community and the LGBT, and I'm your host, remember, today the discussion is gonna be continued part number two. Today, a sponsor and also one of the guests is Michael Lavers from Washington Blade, Steve, for an LGBT journalist, I know that you all know him, and Jariel Valdez, periodista independiente. So we wanna say thank you all of them for enjoy and obviously stay here in UCTV with us. But let me remind you, the demon study is still out there. You wanna get $140 and extra income? Go to the phone number that is at the bottom or send an email is provided by UM, University of Miami. So you can participate about sexual behavior, man to man, LGBT community, everything is going on. You can participate in the survey. It's three survey, you can take them online and you can get up to $140. The DMELO study by UM, University of Miami. Continues in UCTV, let me remind you, bars in Florida serving alcohol, they'll no longer. Right now, if you wanna go to somewhere on a places that you need alcohol, honey, go to the liquor store and go home because mm -mm, it's not open. And it's not over. We want to remind you, keep your mask on. Esto no ha terminado, por eso te queremos decir, póngase su máscara si va a salir. If you're going out, just put your mask on. I don't want you to get in trouble. And I know that it's $50 every time that you get out, no mask. So keep his eye on. The time is right here. So you gotta keep in safe lovers, save your life and continue wearing masks and use the hand sanitizer and wash your hands every time that you can do it. So that's the way it is and that's the new life. That's my recommendation for you. And I know that everybody, we just wanna start with our new guests and politics and LGBT. Let's just start with our guests. But before to do that, let me remind you, Campy Virtual Camp is here because we have Elevate Summer Camp. Virtual Summer Camp is here this Thursday, 7 p.m. Interacting on Facebook, free and fabulous. Thursday, you lay second. Your camp counselor is me, Samantha, and Keisha. The 10th summer camp movie clips, tools for being happy and less toxic, and we the tea summer. So we're gonna have fun on the next Thursday, just to stay connected with us. And remind you, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 4 p.m. here on the fan page on Facebook Live, and then on Instagram and YouTube channel. 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let's just start with our amazing guests. We have Michael Labor and Steve Rotel. Hi, guys. Welcome Hi. and thank you so much for being with you. Hi, Hi Samantha. Hi, Samantha. Great to be here. Hi, Mike. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much. Let's just start this conversation saying with Steve. Steve. We want to know more that you're a professional journalist. Tell me more, a little bit about your life because people want to know more about you. Let's just tell what you do for your life. Sure. So I was a student at FIU studying journalism. I had already gotten my associate's degree at Miami-Dade College studying journalism. And in 1985, I was hired by the Miami Herald. My first job there was to listen to the police radios. And I would go in at five in the afternoon and stay until about two in the morning. So that was my training at the Herald. And within a couple of years, I was covering uh, cities like the Coral Gables police. And I covered all the small towns near Miami Beach. And in 1988, the Herald promoted me and sent me to Key West. And I was the Keys reporter for about a year and a half. And 
After that, I came back to Broward and I covered the Broward Sheriff's Office. Um, but in 1997, that was the summer that Johnny Versace was killed in Miami Beach. And that summer, uh, the international press came to Miami to cover the story and the Herald felt very left out because uh, there was no one at the Herald who basically um, had sourcing within the LGBT community back then. I was out at the Herald from about the time that I arrived. Um, and in the early 90s, I helped form the local chapter for the National Association uh, of LGBTQ Journalists. So they felt comfortable to come to me uh, after the Versace killing to ask if I would be interested in covering you know, the gay community here in Miami. And at the time I told them that would absolutely, I'd be interested with one condition. And they said, what? And I said, well, whatever stories I write, the stories have to run the entire run of the newspaper. And back then we're talking about five, 600,000 uh, copies a day. So they agreed right away that any stories I wrote would run the full run. And that's how I began covering LGBT. And um, basically the, the, the beat just took off. And especially when we started to promote the web and online really you know, did it for me in terms of getting my stories to the public all over the world. Um, I guess around 2000, 13 or 14, I had the number one story that year in not just at the Miami Herald, but the entire McClatchy company. McClatchy's the parent company of the Miami Herald. And it was I, the number one story in page views of any story in the entire company. That's a great story that I had um, been tipped off through my sources that there was a trans man who, no, a transgender woman in the Midwest who died suddenly of a, of a stroke. Her father never accepted her as a woman. And at her funeral, he presented her to friends and family as a man. And the story had more than a million page views, you know, overnight. And the reason why, you know, obviously it was such an interesting story, but what happened was that because I was first, I wrote the story and put it online within a half an hour, everyone stopped talking. The funeral director stopped talking, the family wouldn't talk. So I became the only source for the entire story. So uh, basically everyone was linking to me and, uh, you know, clearly it was, uh, you know, the biggest story that I had in terms of page views, but for the entire company. And that really, uh, you know, demonstrated, you know, how important this beat is that, you know, going either from that into the, um, you know, whole, whole Obergefell case uh, in terms of marriage and, and Windsor, um, you know, I was the first, I'm acknowledged as being the first mainstream LGBT reporter covering a beat at a mainstream newspaper. Um, there were people who had covered HIV AIDS. There were people who covered, you know, specific stories, but mine was covering people. And, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's, how, it, that's how it got started. And, um, you know, that's what I've been doing ever since. Wow, that's amazing, Steve. Everything that you've been doing for your lab, I just wanna say on behalf of the whole community is impressive. And okay. congratulations for everything, everything that you just like get in your goal and do for the community to help each other. But now let's talk with Michael. Michael, I know that you work for the uh, Washington Blair. Tell me more about this organization and tell me about your life. Great. Well, thank you so much, Samantha. And it's a real honor to be here with Steve as well. Um, he certainly is a, a pioneer for all of us LGBTQ journalists. So congratulations, Steve, to okay. your full career and your legacy. And it's an honor to call you a friend, so it's great to be here. Um, and happy Pride, everyone. I know it's yes, not, exactly, happy Pride. not exactly the Pride Month in which all of us envision, but here we are, so it's important to acknowledge that. So I am the international news editor for the Washington Blade. We're the oldest LGBTQ publication in the U.S. I, I've been at the Blade since May of 2012. And a little bit of personal background about me. I'm born and raised in New Hampshire. 
and I graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a degree in journalism and Spanish. I studied in Southern Spain when I was in college. I did my semester abroad in Andalusia and uh, moved to New York City from New Hampshire. And then I moved to DC in uh, October 2011 when I, after I met my now husband with whom I've been, that we've been together for almost a decade. So uh, from New Hampshire to New York, uh, Spain a little bit to here in DC. And the bulk of the work that I've been doing over the last, say, five or so years is covering LGBTQ issues in Latin America. And Cuba is certainly one of the countries that I've gotten to know very well over the last uh, five years. I was also detained in Cuba um, last May when I tried to enter the country to cover LGBTQ issues um, to continue that coverage. And so um, I'm, I'm the first uh, reporter from an LGBTQ publication to report from the ground in Cuba. And um, unfortunately, I'm now on a list by the Cuban government. I'm not allowed to go back into the country. I don't know when that will change. But unfortunately, that's the situation in which I find myself. But at any rate, um, so I've covered Cuba. I've covered Central America. I've covered Puerto Rico. I've covered Colombia. I've covered many other countries around the world. And so um, it's been really interesting for me to have the chance to document and to report what um, the LGBTQ community is facing in these countries. And um, it's been a real privilege to bring that coverage to our readers here in DC. And so that's a little bit about myself. And um, yeah, and also I jokingly tell people Miami is my second home. I'm always in Miami. I was there a few weeks ago and can't wait to get back and see all of you again. Thank you, Mike, for that. And and I know that you're being involved for being activist for the community and LGBT. We learn every day from you. And I have you on my Instagram. I have you on my Facebook. So I want you to everybody follow him and stay connected because he's always have a really good news for everybody. Thank you. Now I want to continue this conversation because we let me remind you today is the second part that we're talking about politics and LGBT politics. So what's going on? What we have to do and what we need to fix with our people just to stay connected with politics. The media, what the media is doing right now to helping the LGBT community. So I have this question for both of you guys. How important is to have an openly LGBT plus political and allies electing in why? Let's start with Steve. Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, essential that we have representation at all levels of government. And that's something that we're beginning to see. I mean, here in Florida, uh, David Richardson was elected in 2013, I believe, 2012, and he became the first openly gay representative in the Florida legislature. And you know th that in itself, just having somebody who's out, who you know interacts with other people on the same professional level, uh, somebody who's there, you know, who has a career outside of politics and who has a, an expertise like like David had in, in you know, in, in accounting. I think that, you know, the, it it's a great leveler for us. Um, we see people now. I mean, there are gay governors. Uh, there are people in Congress. Uh, so, I mean, we really are everywhere. We the Victory Fund uh, <laughs> candidates are you know, in, at every level and in, in states all across the country. And it's absolutely important that we be visible, you know, on all levels. Thank you for that, Steve. Now for Michael. Michael, what do you think about it's very important to have an openly LGBT political and allies and why? Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with what Steve said. And I'm often reminded when I hear this question, there's a saying, and I think it comes from the Victory Fund actually, but you often hear when you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And certainly that applies to LGBTQ folks, um, you know, who are uh, in politics. And I, you know, I often use the example, I think of what we have here around DC, uh, Virginia delegate Danica Rome in 2017 became the first openly transgender person a transgender woman elected to a state legislature in the U.S. and she actually defeated a 
a longtime uh, incumbent who was one of the most anti-LGBTQ represent uh, members of the Virginia General Assembly. She's also a former journalist as well, so that's why she's great. One of the many reasons why she's great, but uh, she brought that voice to the table in Virginia. And so Virginia over the last um, legislative session had a lot of progress on LGBTQ issues, most notably adding gender identity and sexual orientation to the uh, state non-discrimination law. That law takes effect this week. And somebody like Danica Rome and the other folks in the General Assembly who are LGBTQ, when there's debates about LGBTQ rights, issue LGBTQ rights, they really put a face to the issue. And Danica specifically did just that. I can think of many, many other examples. Um, Richie Torres in uh, New York City just last week seems to have defeated a longtime uh, city councilman, Ruben Diaz Sr., who is very vocally hostile towards the LGBTQ community. And having somebody like uh, Councilman Torres looking as though he is going to be um, the next representative in Congress for that district, really, it's just, it's just so incredibly important to have folks who are members of the LGBTQ community at the table talking about LGBTQ issues and really putting a face to that issue, moving that forward. And so visibility matters and uh, we're only gonna concede, we're gonna continue to see more of that, but it's so incredibly important especially now when um, we have the administration we have here in D.C. and um, LGBTQ issues are very much part of the uh, national discourse. Thank you, Mike, for that answer. I think that is very important. Uh, but what you both guys said, it is, and also, it is important just to encourage the community just to stay connected and participate because some, most of the time we have this piety information between the LGBT and we don't know what to do. We don't know what the people that is doing good things for us. So it's good just to let the people we are working for you, but it's necessary that you work with us continuously. So be, that being saying, I have another question and, and is how important is to have, um, how make politicals ally for the LGBT community? And why? Well, in, ter in terms of, of having allies and having people that we can go to, um, you know, look, if you don't have the political contacts, if you don't have the ability to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, this is what we need, you're not going to get anything. I mean, we went through, you know, years and years of having nothing. Um, you know, much of it is just being out. It's being who we are, and but being out either as constituents or being out as elected officials. And, you know, it's very easy to demonize people who are invisible. And it's much more difficult to look somebody else in the eye and say, I'm going to deny you your rights for this, that, or the other. And, you know, you, and, and, you know to have people look back at you and say, you're wrong. And, you know, you, you're not treating me as, you know, as, as an equal to you. Uh, so it's absolutely important. It's, it's important for us to be out in our lives for the same reason. Just going to work, going to school. You know, that's why, you know, when you're not visible, it's very easy to pass over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, Mike. Now the question for you is, you representing the LGBT community, what do we look for from the LG from politicals to the LGBT? You as a journalist professional, what do you think that we look for? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. And, you know, we as journalists, at least, you know, those of us who go to journalism school are taught very early on that we have an obligation to remain objective. Um, certainly that's a noble ideal, but at some point in this, I think of the work that I do in um, Latin America, oftentimes we as journalists have a responsibility and a duty to bear witness to what's going on. So for example, when I would go to Cuba, I often would um, spend a lot of time with independent LGBTQ activists and you know, highlight this, the persecution which they were facing 
In some cases, I would write about being under surveillance myself. I would be, um, I was stopped by the police. I would see police officers standing outside of my house where I was staying. So on one hand, we're there to objectively report on a situation, but on the other hand, you also have a responsibility to bear witness to something like human rights violations or police brutality, anything like that. So um, it's really important to be present, to be visible. But I think in terms of politicians, our job is to hold them accountable for what they do and for what they don't do. So for example, uh, we here in DC at The Blade, we, we cover the Trump administration quite closely. My colleague, Chris Johnson is a White House reporter. He's in the White House almost every day. He's asking the press secretary questions about, say, you know, why did the Trump administration decide to reinstate the ban on openly transgender service members, for example? So it's our responsibility to hold the administration to account for its actions on that issue. Um, immigration is an issue that I've been covering quite a bit over the last few years. So. I've been asking folks such as at U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, what are you doing to ensure that LGBTQ folks in your custody are being treated adequately? In the case of Yadiel, um, as you may know, he was in ICE custody for almost a year. We covered his case extensively from the perspective of this as a journalist, but at some point, he himself was advocate, he was reporting on his own case from inside detention as a way to highlight what was going on. And we have the responsibility to, at the Blade, we at the Blade have the responsibility to bear witness to what was going on. Thank God he was released. I was the one that actually picked him up, but that's another example of documenting his case over the last um, year and something months to using his case with his support and with his encouragement and for what he was doing on the inside to hold the powers that be accountable. And it's really about accountability and it's really about, you know, demanding politicians um, explain why they do something or why they don't do something. So it's Michael, really important for us as account to be accountable, to hold folks accountable. Michael, I have a question for you. Um, yes, sir. The Blade, are you credentialed by the White House? Yes. To, yes. Okay. Um, and are, are you called on at meetings, at, yes. at press conferences? Um, Chris Johnson certainly is. Right. Yes. Yes, and we're the only LGBTQ publication that's a, that's credentialed in the White House. Right. That's great. That's a great question. Um, Steve, now your question is, do you think that it's important to have a party affiliation? Well, you know, it's interesting. In Florida, um, you know, you need to be registered for a party in order to vote in primaries. Um, the law has changed recently in which, you know, if there's um, a primary and the primary is going to be decided, you know, decide for the, for the general, say oh, two Democrats or two Republicans. Now people can vote and cross over to vote in that primary. For instance, in the um, state attorney's race, uh, which is partisan, uh, that there is, you know, there are two uh, Democrats running in the race, and now that's open to everyone to vote because there are no Republicans in the race. But I mean, absolutely. I mean, I've known people who are independents, and they have no voice, no say in a primary. And often, you know, the elections are, you know, finalized in the primary. And and uh, you know, beyond that, you know, people have talked to me about, you know, what should they do? They like a politician who says you know, a registered Republican, they like the person, but, you know, they, they, they're troubled voting for a Republican, perhaps. And I know that this came up uh, a couple of years ago with someone like Carlos Curbelo, who was the Republican congressman from Miami, and people really like Carlos. And he's been with the LGBT community on nearly every issue. He was there for workplace issues. But people said, you know, but we we are troubled in terms of actually voting for him in a close race because, you know, yes, he's with us on all of these issues, but he's a Republican. And, you know, what should we do? Because we don't want to see a Republican speaker. We want to see a majority, you know, in Congress, in the House, 
So they, you know, I said, look, you have to do what you think is the right thing. And, you know, they go with, you know, either party, obviously. Um, but, you know, yes, I mean, you have to be aware of the, of the universal picture. And that is if you want to control the House or the Senate, you know, if you're one party or the other, you have to vote for people in that party. And you can't say, well, I like this person, I'm going to vote for them because that may be, but you're not going to be able to get what you want, regardless of you know, which party you're affiliated with. So I, mean, I think that that did hurt Carlo. Uh, he was defeated in his reelection campaign. Uh, Debbie Mercosul Powell won that race. And I think that it was not because people necessarily liked her better than Carlos, but because then they looked at the big picture and they wanted to see Nancy Pelosi keep the house. And that's what they did. So now that you mentioned this, Steve, I would like to ask you, um, to somebody in our audio, our auditorium says like, how do black life matters and trans black life matter work together? I know maybe, maybe one of you can answer this question. So what's your recommendation about this, um, this, uh, question. Well, I mean, to begin with, I mean, we hear similar talk from some people that they want to know, like, trans people, you know, that's gender identity. It's not sexual orientation. Uh, I hear gay men still say, I don't get it. Why am I fighting for trans rights? I'm not a trans person. And, and it's not the same thing. And, you know, basically, You know, the answer from me is that, you know, you have to support people because you a, have, may have common enemies, you may have common goals, and it's important for us to look beyond, you know, simply supporting people who are exactly like us. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I see, you know, the, the, the intersection between trans people and Black Lives Matter and then obviously, you know, Black you know, trans people that, you know, basically all of our rights are on the line. And, you know, you can't say, you know, we're going to give you full rights, but not you. And, and because it, it, if no one has all the rights, then, then it's across <clears throat> the board, then we, we, no one has them. If, if, if any one person doesn't. And I'd like to, and, yeah, I'd like to add on to what Steve was just saying. There's a lot of talk There's the, I think there's increasing talk about this whole idea of intersectionality. You know, we're all fighting, you know, broadly speaking, we're all fighting for progressive values. And I think, you know, speaking just strictly from here in DC, there's definitely, I've seen just in, you know, our coverage of the protests here in DC and in Baltimore that there is a real, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, LGBTQ folks are definitely, you know, working together to some degree. There's obviously tensions between one group versus another, but I think you're starting to see that, especially in light of the George Floyd situation, the George Floyd killing. And um, and I think the case in Tallahassee with Tony McDade, the uh, black transgender man who was killed by the white police officer, right as I think it was just a couple of days after George Floyd's murder, uh, kill, uh, death in Minneapolis, Uh, highlights those intersections of race and gender identity and LGBTQ issues and socioeconomic status. Um, it's a very complicated thing to talk about to some degree, but I think as you know, the last few weeks have shown us, I know that the Human Rights Campaign building is three blocks from my house here in D.C., and they have a huge banner on the side of the, their building, Black Lives Matter, Trans, Black Trans Lives Matter, Uh, so they're really highlighting that intersectionality. And you're starting to see more and more LGBTQ advocacy groups do that and also some of the other black advocacy groups as well. So, sure. um, and I, you know, looking abroad, um, one of the things I've noticed in Latin America for years is that this concept of intersectionality has been very front and center. In some ways, there's strength in numbers. A lot of these groups communities are so incredibly marginalized in places like Colombia and places like El Salvador. A lot of these groups don't have a choice but to show their solidarity with the women's rights movement or movements for the rights of people of African descent or people who are, are indigenous, et cetera, et cetera. So 
that's been happening in many movements in Latin America for years, and you're starting to really see that happening here in the U.S., especially with the uh, the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and the uh, Black Lives Matter protest movement that's continuing to gain ground, and people also challenging the Trump administration's white supremacy and their racism, and so it's all kind of coming together, I think, at this point. I don't know if, if anywhere else, but here in Miami, in Miami Lakes, uh, last week, uh, you know, a, a pro-Trump group that was protesting against Black Lives Matter, and that protest of theirs devolved into mm-hmm. anti-LGBTQ chants. Yeah. That, you know, this group in Miami Lakes, I mean, that's where they went. And, you know, so mm-hmm. you, you can't just separate it out. We, you know, clearly we are all subject to the prejudices and, and the bigotry of, of people who, you know, hate other people. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there are very few people who hate only a few people. Yeah. And it's also worth noting, too, that, you know, anti-LGBT violence and discrimination is still very much an issue. We had an incident just this weekend here in D.C. where a transgender woman was attacked by several people on U Street, which is one of our main entertainment corridors. It's, you know, so this is still happening in spite of everything that's going on. And um, so we need to remember that. Let's introduce our next amazing guest. His name is Yariel Valdez, periodista independiente, también del Washington Blade. Así que vamos a tenerlo aquí para todos ustedes. Let's give you some introduction to Yariel Valdez. He's going to talk with us. Hi, Yariel. How are you? Hi, Samantha. I'm fine. Muy bien, muy bien. Me gustaría que hicieras una pequeña introducción acerca de qué es lo que hace para el Washington Play y quién eres tú para que las personas sepamos un poco más de tu vida. Bueno, eh, yo soy periodista, soy de Cuba. Eh, trabajaba en Cuba para medios independientes. Finalmente, eh, eh, ¿me escuchan? Creo que tengo algún problema. No, no te preocupes. Te, te, te estamos escuchando y te estamos viendo. Puedes continuar. Okay, mientras en el mismo, in the meantime that he's fixing everything, you know, because this is life and things happen, and so anytime. So let's continue. Ya, se me va, se me va esto. Te puedo ver completamente, continúa. So let's go ahead, guys. Okay, so Mike, what you mentioned something about the disparity for the LGBT community that is facing right now, and then Steve was saying something, but Yariel, ya voy a continuar contigo, that um, Steve was saying something about a few weeks with the former president, and it's something about the Black Lives Matters. So, and now it pop up these questions. What are the issues? I have this question for you, but I'm gonna just to like, you know, so you have a little bit of time so you can think about it, you guys, Mike and Steve. Y luego continuo, continuo contigo, Chariel, porque quiero que continúes para que nos digas quién eres tú, qué es lo que haces, y para que muchas personas más te puedan seguir en las redes sociales por lo que estás haciendo por la comunidad en estos momentos. So um, the question is for you guys, just to think about it. What are the issues that right now our community is facing and how can politics affect our change? This question is for you, Yariel. ¿Me puedes escuchar? Eh, tuve algunos problemitas técnicos. Cambié eh, el medio de comunicación eh, y, y espero que me puedan escuchar ahora. ¿Me escuchan? Claro que sí, te estoy escuchando correctamente. Continúa. No sé qué pasa. ¿Me escuchan ahora? Okay, so let's continue with you guys. In the meantime, we are fixing this. So what are the issues for our community is facing right now and how can politics affect the change? Steve. Well, I mean, two weeks ago, LGBTQ people won a great victory at the Supreme Court. It was an unexpected victory. I think that most of our groups, uh, you know, truly expected that we were not going to win uh, the ruling in workplace protections to, you know, be included in, in Title VII. Um, but that vote was six to three, which actually, I mean, is not as close as five to four, which is 
pretty much what we've been used to having in the last you know decade or so but you know again it strikes you know that that we we happen to be quite fortunate that one of Donald Trump's appointees actually wrote that decision uh, but again it reminds us how fragile you know all of our uh, you know, our legal standing is based upon who's sitting in court. And, and the fact that in the last three years, uh, the Trump White House has appointed two Supreme Court justices and, you know, just countless numbers of federal judges all across the country. And, you know, as we're going into this election in November, I think one of the things that people have to remember is that you know, we need the courts to be supportive. You know, that's where we've received, you know, our, our greatest victories legally. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily, you know, a great way to, you know, win our rights through court decisions. I think that it would be preferable to be able to win them uh, through the legislative, legislative branches. But, you know, that's it. And, and you know, today uh, the uh, Louisiana abortion law was struck down, but these laws are all very fragile based upon who's sitting on the court. And, you know, another four years of this administration, and he's made very clear, the president, that he will be, you know, naming justices who will be basically anti-gay, anti-abortion, and on and on and on. And you know, is that a risk that people want to take? And I, I think that they don't. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael, what do you think that I said? Yes, Steve? No, as I was just saying, that, that's, that in itself is a reason to, to vote for one candidate or the other. Yeah, I'm just going to add on. It can make a hack impact. I'm sorry. And it make a hack impact. What you just said is just make a huge difference for politics and, you know, people to know more about that. Um, now with you, Mike, um, what do you think that there is the disparities and the issue for the communities is facing right now and how politics affect the change? Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Steve just said. We had the Title Seven ruling two weeks ago and it really surprised everyone, A, that it actually was a ruling in favor of the community, but also it was a, by a six to three margin. I don't think anybody really expected that to happen. That said, um, the, literally three days before uh, the Trump administration published its final ruling, uh, final rule that allows discrimination against transgender people under the Affordable Care Act. And so, as Steve said very correctly, um, the legal advance, the legal situation that we have as LGBTQ folks is very fragile, and it only takes one or two judges to really change that. And so I use that as looking at the bigger picture when uh, we're going into a presidential election cycle where uh, the future of our rights as LGBTQ Americans is really at stake. And what you're seeing here in DC with the uh, national LGBT groups, the human rights campaign, most notably, is they're really ramping up to oppose uh, the Trump administration and what it has been doing over the last uh, three and a half since it's been in office, not only on LGBTQ issues, but immigration, reproductive rights, everything that <clears throat> everything that progressives care a lot about. And so the real priority, I think, at this point for national LGBTQ advocacy groups and also some of the statewide organizations is to do everything they can to get Trump out of office and to get somebody like Joe Biden. I'm not going to say specifically who I personally support. That's not why we're here. But um, certainly there's a lot of opposition to the Trump administration and what it's been doing since it took office. And there's a real desire and there's a real push to get them out of the White House. And that's going to only grow stronger as we get towards the election in November 3rd. Thank you for that. Steve, a perfect question for you now that we don't have almost like 15 minutes left just to give you the opportunity to Jariel to talk about what he's doing for the community. But here is Jariel. ¿Todo está bien contigo? ¿Ahora sí podemos escucharte? He tenido algunos problemitas técnicos, pero les pido disculpas por eso. 
eh, es un gran placer estar aquí de, de regreso contigo, Samantha, con, con Michael y con Steve. Un verdadero placer saludarles. Eh, bueno, les decía que, bueno, yo vengo de Cuba, soy periodista independiente, allá trabajé para, primero con los medios oficiales, luego con los medios eh, independientes, y eh, realmente... Eh, Continúa, tuve, te puedo escuchar, eh, no te preocupes. Que regrese, tuve que salir... Eh... ¿Me escuchan? ¿Me siguen escuchando? Te estamos escuchando completamente. Ok, ok. Eh, bueno, llegué aquí a los Estados Unidos... Eh, realmente en un proceso de asilo político por toda eh, la persecución que sufrí en, en Cuba debido a mi labor como periodista independiente. Allá eh, hacía eh, periodismo, alguna parte de periodismo LGTB con una eh, página web, una revista que se llama Tremenda Nota eh, que cubre la agenda LGTB en Cuba. Y luego eh, en México, pues comencé a vincularme con el trabajo eh, con el Blade. Ahí fui unos cuantos meses corresponsal del Blade en México, cubriendo la agenda LGTB. Y bueno, acá en Miami, bueno, pues estoy también colaborando con el Blade, haciendo algunas historias desde, desde casa, debido a que esta, esta pandemia nos ha recluido a todos en casa. Y bueno, eh, tratando de comenzar a, a tener algunos contactos con, con otros medios para, para poder comenzar mi nueva vida laboral y mi nueva vida, vida en libertad acá en, en Estados Unidos. Yaniel, te deseamos lo mejor y todo el trabajo que estás haciendo para toda la comunidad latina y los que están dentro y fuera de Cuba. Eres un excelente ícono, un excelente eh, meta a seguir por muchas cosas que queremos lograr por nuestros futuros, por nuestros derechos y por justamente no solamente por ti, por, la, por las próximas generaciones también, por lo que estás haciendo y darle a entender la verdadera historia de lo que viviste tú y a dónde has estado. Te felicito y sobre todo quisiera decirte que sigas adelante con tus propósitos y aquí siempre vas a tener una casa abierta en Unity Coalition para todos los proyectos que quieras hacer y de seguir adelante. Pero te quiero pedir, por favor, de que antes de cerrarnos, porque nos faltan ya 15 minutos, quisiera decirte que estuvieras solo un poquito de tiempo porque tengo la última pregunta para Mike y para Steve para ya podernos despedir y me quedo ya contigo para cerrar el programa. ¿Te parece? Muy bien, perfecto. So, Steve, en estos momentos, this is the question for you, just to finish with our panel discussion today in politics and LGBT politics for the LGBT community. So the question is like, What we can do when politicals don't do what they promise? Well, I mean, I think that uh, they need to be called on it every chance you get. We're all on social media, and I think that that's fine. But ultimately, uh, people in politics, they listen to voters. And the most important thing that anyone can do is if you don't like your senator, you don't like your congressman, you don't like your legislator, Vote and vote for somebody else and support somebody else in the race. Don't just wait until election day to cast your vote. Help another candidate get elected. Find somebody who you can feel comfortable to support, somebody who uh, you know represents your values and your, 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 your mindset. If you have some money, that, that'd be great to contribute. But if you don't, see what you can do to help them. Get the word out. So. Do what you can to put people in who will, you know, support you. Yeah. Um, with this conversation to the end with Mike. So the question is now for you, Steve. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for being with us in UCTV. I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Steve, so now... He said bye. Oh, by the way, he was a daddy. He was very good. So now, Mike, <laughs> that's my favorite word. And everybody know me. Daddy's always around me. You, you're daddy too. So come on, come on. So what we can do when politicals, they don't do what they promise. What's your recommendation now that you know everything about Latino, Hispanic, and everything? You've been in the middle between and gringos and Latinos and everything. So what we can do when politicals They don't do they don't do what they promise. Yeah, I, I you know, I think of um, you know, I hate to keep going back to Cuba, but I'm gonna go back to Cuba. Um, Cuba is one of the countries that 
you know, people don't have a voice. People don't have the right to determine their self, um, their their destiny. Yadiel's case is a, prime, is a great example of that. So I think one of the things that we in the United States can do to hold our elected officials accountable is to vote. That's our right as Americans. We should exercise that. And if somebody who uh, claims to represent us but is not doing that, whether at the local level, the state level, or the federal level, we have the right to hold them to account by by using our power at the ballot box. And so that's the ideal that I think um, we as Americans should hold near and dear to our hearts is that we have the power to vote. And that can really determine the outcome of um, all of these issues we're talking about, whether LGBTQ rights, immigration, reproductive rights, uh, whatever issue about which you care, you want to see move forward, that power really comes back to the ability to vote. And we, we as Americans really need to exercise that and use that to hold uh, our politicians to account. And so we should certainly be doing that in November. Thank you so much for that. And Mike, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, because always that we need you. We stay here with that community. Even though you're not in Florida, you look like you're living in Florida, honey. So let me tell you, um, you're a Floridian. You're a Floridian. <laughs> with that being said, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you to have this conversation for politics and LGBT for the community. I hope to see you next time. Gracias, mi amor. Gracias a ti. Ahora seguimos con Yariel. Yariel, ¿dónde te encuentras? Dime entonces, ¿cómo ha pasado todo esto de ser reconocido, de haber salido de Cuba y ahora estar aquí en Miami trabajando? Déjame preguntarte algo. Tú como periodista independiente, ¿cuál es tu recomendación? ¿Cómo eh, el periodismo es importante para la comunidad LGBT? Pues, ¿Cómo podemos introducirnos, introducirnos más? No sé si me puedes escuchar o te estoy escuchando, porque te puedo, no te puedo escuchar, eh, es como un silencio mientras que lo arreglamos. I just wanted to remind you, everybody, just go and visit our website, unitycoalition.org, and stay connected with the different program that we have, because we've been in South Florida since 2002 for Latinos, Hispanic, and Indigenous LGBTQ+, plus in South Florida. In the meantime, are you ready for Elevate Virtual Summer Campy? This Thursday, 7 p.m., interacting on Facebook free. And the best part is because it's fabulous. So go to the unitycoalition.org. And this Thursday, July 2nd, your campy counselor is me, Samantha, and Keisha. We're going to have fun. We're going to stay connected. We're going to. So, Yariel, ya me puedes escuchar. Hablame a ver si te puedes escuchar. Sí, sí. ¿me escuchas ahora? Claro que sí te puede escuchar. Continúa ahora sí. Bueno, eh, le decía que eh, tener un medio de comunicación que sea tu aliado, que denuncie todas la, las situaciones que, que suceden en la comunidad LGTB, por supuesto es, es una fuerza muy importante. Eh, por lo tanto, eh, que, que podamos sentirnos libres y poder decir, tengo aquí mi espacio y puedo denunciar todo lo que sucede, evidentemente, es algo que tenemos que eh, aprovechar, sobre todo eh, en este país donde hay una libertad de expresión, hay una libertad de prensa y se pueden denunciar todo tipo de situaciones. Eh, eso es un arma que realmente debemos aprender eh, a, 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 a utilizar mucho mejor. Eh, en el caso de Cuba no, no sucede así, es el, el contexto de Cuba es mucho más eh, complejo. Eh, estamos hablando de, de una dictadura que no promueve mucho los derechos de la comunidad y por lo tanto eh, eh, lo que son los medios independientes son los que pueden y de hecho reportan sobre lo que sucede con la comunidad LGTB, cómo es marginada, cómo es discriminada por la propia eh, oficialidad, por el propio gobierno del país. Entonces yo creo que eh, tener eh, en este país periódicos, tener revistas, tener um, radios, tener televisiones que hablen sobre eh, la comunidad y que se enfoquen específicamente sobre la comunidad, como es el caso 
del Washington Blake y de otras muchas más publicaciones. Eh, creo que es algo eh, muy importante y que eh, debemos celebrar, sobre todo, y, y saber aprovechar. Gracias, Yaniel, por dar. Houston, I love you. Yes, it is important to light up information about LGBT and journalists. That's why we have this information for you. And I want to say saludos para toda mi gente en Colombia. Happy Pride for all of you. Celebremos de la mejor manera. Yariel, para ti también. Felicitaciones. Happy Pride. Feliz Día del Orgullo. Para mi gente latina, hispana, aquí en el sur de la Florida y fuera del sur de la Florida, Hemos ganado una batalla, seantémonos, vamos a sentirnos orgullosos de lo que somos, de las personas que representamos, de nuestro país, de nuestra cultura y sobre todo de el amor que sentimos el uno por el otro. Con esto yo les quiero decir chicos y chicas que nos faltan solamente como cinco minutos, pero queremos saber mucho más de lo que hace Yariel y de lo importante que es tener un periodista independiente LGBT para nuestra comunidad, para que ustedes puedan sentirse mejor informados de lo que está pasando alrededor, porque podemos tener mucha más confianza entre nuestra comunidad. Así que en el mismo momento les quiero decir, muy pronto estén conectados. So stay connecting with us because soon we're going to give more food. We have more food distribution. In a few days you're going to know more about just stay connecting and follow the fan page on Facebook, unitycoalition.org, on Instagram, unitycoalition, or the channel and the YouTube channel, Unity Coalition. So ya lo saben, para todas las personas que quieran saber mucha más información, los recursos comunitarios se encuentran también en nuestra página web. Así que todo lo que quieran saber dónde está abierto, qué no está abierto, qué pasa durante el COVID, what's going on with, during the COVID-19, what's open, what is not open, everything that you need to know is just right there on the website, unitycoalition.org. Go and scroll down until you see community resorts. So black light matters, trans light matters, everything matters, every color matters. So every color of the rainbow matters. ¿Verdad, Yariel? Para toda la comunidad, déjame decirte un saludito que le quieras mandar a toda mi gente porque ya nos faltan solo pocos minutos y esa recomendación que le quieres dar a todos los latinos que te quieren seguir y que conocen más sobre ti. Parece que se desconectó Yariel, pero en el mismo momento, déjenme decirles, chicos, it's been a such a great, great talk show today. Yariel, ¿ahora sí me puedes escuchar? Creo que en el mismo tiempo estamos, ¿me puedes escuchar ahora sí? Sí, sí, te puedo escuchar. El Perfecto, mensaje, recomendación rápido, que parece que el sistema se quiere así como ir y corriendo. Exacto, es que, que sean felices, que no tengan miedo de eh, presentarse como son, que luchen por sus derechos, que luchen por, por sus conquistas, por lo que deseen, eh, que amen a quien deseen amar. Y realmente eh, el mensaje es eso, que traten de vivir su vida como, como deseen y a luchar por todas las injusticias. Ese es mi mensaje. Muchísimas gracias por esa recomendación. So, thank you all for that. Thank you, Yariel. Thank you, Abby. I want to say hi to my friend. Beto in Colombia. So, Beto, thank you so much. I love you all. I hope you have a wonderful and the rest of your Monday. Just to stay connected with UCTV. Remember, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here on Facebook Live and five on Instagram and YouTube. That's all for today. Thank you all. Remember, this you Thursday, you lay second, 7 p.m. fan page, Facebook Live. YouTube, Instagram, Unity Coalition TV is presenting Elevate Virtual Summer Campy, Kishi and I, Samantha Letois. We're going to have fun. We're going to have the top 10, top 10 summer camp movie clips, tools for being happier and less toxics, honey, because we don't want toxic people around us. So this is the time just to have fun, disconnect for everything that's happened with the COVID is stressed, depressed. Oh, honey, mm -mm. we got that time for you. So remember this Thursday, 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. And with that, we want to say thank you. Thank you so much. I love you all. And I hope to see you next time. It's me, Samantha Letroy, and this is UCTV. Bye-bye.